Good morning, church. So good to see all of you this morning. If you're watching online, good to see you too. If you're watching from Connecticut, hello. Make sure you go to your brick and mortar real church too. Um, but we are so glad that we can have our online service because we, there are a lot of people who aren't able, physically capable of being here. And so we're glad that you can join us too. And so... Um, Back when I was in January, here in January, I preached a sermon, basically why we exist as a church. And that was something that was decided long before me. God tells us why the church ex exists. In fact, when the Bible uses the term church, it's talking about one of two things. It's talking about the local gathering of believers together, or it's talking about the church universal, all born-again believers who have put their faith in Jesus in every time and every place. And that's why I love Communion Sunday, because that's something that we get to do that's celebrating, an odd term, but it's celebrating the death of Jesus because of what it means for us that has happened for 2,000 years in cultures very unlike ours, but all doing that same thing. And so that's a wonderful thing. The Greek word for church is ekklesia. And most of the time, when the Bible is referring to church, it may surprise you to know, but I did say this in January as well, it's referring to the local church, the local body of believers. And we talked about the purpose. Why does Riverside Baptist Church exist? And it's in our logo. We exist for bringing people to Christ, growing in Christ, and serving as Christ. That is basically the def definition of what the church does, why it exists, and I wanted to do a part two of this series. So we exist to bring people to Christ, grow in Christ, and serve as Christ. And all of us individuals being members of this particular church, that's our goal. All of us individually should be supporting Riverside Baptist Church because the church isn't a building. It's not the elders. It's not the pastor. It is us. Those who have put their faith in Jesus Christ. We're, we all have different roles. We all serve in different functions. But we all have that same purpose. And my goal today is for you to really realize, and I realize I'm, you know, to use the expression, preaching to the choir in some instances because you're here and most of you serve and you give and all those things. But to realize how important the church is to God and his plan in this dark world but also how important it is in our own individual lives so that you don't waste your life not prioritizing it for you and your family. And I'm going to go through this a lot where I don't remember if I shared this before because I shared it so much at my former church. But this is a very real thing for me because early in our marriage, my wife would have to drag me to church kicking and screaming. I mean, not literally, but I would do anything to get out of going to church. I didn't see the value of it until I hit rock bottom in my life, and I'm not going to go over all that again, but God changed everything in my life, and then you couldn't keep me away from being at church and serving in church and all of those things. And the problem is in our culture, you know, back in a long time ago, there wasn't a whole lot else to do. I mean, you know, there was chopping wood and you know, farming and, you know, doing things to do help around the house. But in this day and age, we have a lot more distractions than they used to have back then. You know, we have things like phones. We have things like sports. You know, that you used to have nothing on Sundays. That was the day where businesses were closed, even in Connecticut. And, you know, things were shut down and it was all about, you know, honoring God. Or at least if you weren't out in church, you were doing something with your family. And all of that stuff is gone now. But and I'm not, I'm not saying phones, sports, things like that are bad things. Those are good things. But I want to talk about priorities because our priorities should be what God prioritizes. And not consumerism and not this like, you know, am I being fed? And do I like the music? Do I like this or that? You know, I hope Riverside Baptist Church, I hope you are being fed at Riverside Baptist Church, but I also said this before, is babies need to be fed, Big, big boys and big girls, they learn to feed themselves. So this is something that should supplement what you're already doing um, on your own and through the different Bible studies and ministries. We have so many Bible studies. I love it. Just Wednesday at lunch, you know, I get to like Jerry Slot and Dean and others, you know, we, we go and we dig into the word of God and I just learn so much. It's like such a blessing. Like I was praying at the end and just thanking God that I get to be part of this church. And so many of you know the Bible so well. So I love like learning along with, with all of you. And so 
this church being your home, I hope that you understand how important it is. Get plugged into it and say, I'm a part of this church and I'm going to support it. But we're going to start with three ways that God views the church. Also, I don't know, I think Pastor TJ did this at one point, but he had blanks in your notes. So if you pull your notes out of your bulletin, and I want to encourage you to get a bulletin every week, not only because Sheila works really hard to print them out and give you information about what's going on at the church, you can find out what's going on in the church through the bulletin. So you have no excuse for saying, I didn't know because you have access to that every week. And, you know, we have emails and announcements and all those things. But also, it's really good. She, it's a beautiful bulletin. Uh, she does a great job at it. And, um, but it also is going to have your notes in it to keep you on task, so you got to wonder what those blanks are. And I don't know, my, my church I came from, I would look at the blanks, and my son Andrew and I, we would always try to guess what's going to go in the blank before it comes. And then, you know, we would be right or we would be wrong. But let's start with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this church. Thank you for Riverside Baptist Church. Thank you for those faithful people that started this church over 100 years ago, um, having faith and wanting to glorify you. And God, we have the same desire today. We honor those who have gone before us, Lord, and and trusted in you and built this church and the physical building here, God, um, but also everything, the things that we believe and holding your word high as the standard and the foundation for our lives, the solid rock on which we stand. And so, God, I pray that you open our hearts and our minds. God, I pray that each individual, no matter how committed we are, God, you show us some way that we can take some part of what we do to the next level in in serving your church and fulfilling your plan. We thank you, God, that you use broken, messed up, sinful people, God, that you redeem us, that we are forgiven, and that you can use us for your glorious purposes, God. You, the same God that created the stars, that told every lightning bolt where it should go, you use broken people, God, because we can do great things through you who, in our strength, you're, you're, in our weakness, your strength is made perfect. So we love you, we praise you. Speak to us today in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so we're going to move around a little bit in the Bible. I do have a nice a series planned in a couple weeks, um, but I'm not going to tell you what it is yet, but it's just going to be, it's, it's going to be the best series you've ever heard. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> I'm excited to share it. I actually have a couple series. You know, I, get to, I got to preach very, like, sporadically, so now it's like everything I always wanted to share, like God has laid on my heart to share with the church. You know, I have to, like, kind of prioritize it and order it and everything, but... Um, I am really excited to share it. But we're going to start with three ways God views the church. And we're going to start in 1 Corinthians 12. Um, Some of you are probably familiar with 1 Corinthians. And that's a church where people, there's a couple issues going on. One is division, but another one is ignorance about spiritual gifts and how how they work and what their purpose is within the church. And I'm just going to hit each of these, a little snippet of each of these. But Paul's talking about the church and trying to clear up their understanding of spiritual gifts because they were seeing the gift of speaking in tongues as like the super gift. And if you speak in tongues and, you know, you're, you're a super Christian and if you can't, everybody should be able to do it. And, you know, there's still uh, certain uh, religious traditions that, that believe that. But Paul in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14 is very clear in straightening them out. But he's talking about, he compares the church to a human body. In verse 12, he says, for just as the body is one and has many members in all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. And then in verse 27, he says, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. So he's comparing the church, he's calling it the body of Christ, and he's comparing it to a human body. And he you know, goes into exposition a lot more on the topic um, in that passage in 1 Corinthians 12, but he's basically saying the human body has many parts. Every part has a function. They don't all have the same function. God has given each part, each gift, exactly what is necessary, and the ultimate purpose of the church is to edify. The ultimate purpose of spiritual gifts is to edify, to build up the body of believers, And that each of us have a role to play. Every single one of us have a role to play in it. And that's the first point. The church is the body of Christ and you are a vital part of it. You're a vital part of it. In fact, Paul goes, he he says in between those two verses, he says, if, if if you say, oh, why am I not a hand or why am I not an eye? I wish I was this part or that part. We have to trust the gifts that God has given us to perform that function. But he said it's the parts that are less 
uh, exciting because obviously you see like, oh, you know, Travis and Sherry singing and Scott playing drums and Jay playing guitar and, you know, Amanda doing bass. And you see like these people, you see these gifts or, you know, me speaking. Those are the things that you see. Those are sort of the flashy things. But it's the behind the scene th things, um, you know, Dave Rashi making sure I, I sound good. I mean, I, you know, or, you know, people in the back switching cameras and things like that. Or people like sharing, like people cleaning the church and making it so it's like a, a beautiful place to come into. All the different things that we don't see, especially on a Sunday morning, it says those are the gifts that are worthy of extra honor. Those are the really important gifts. I think of like, you know, you don't see my heart. I could live without a hand, but I can't live without a heart. Well, maybe they, they manufacture some kind of thing that will pump my blood. I don't know. I certainly can't live without a brain. All right. I caught my filter catches things sometimes. You're welcome. Well, some of you would have liked it, but I'm not going to say it. Um, so, it, but all of us are a necessary part of it. That's how God makes the human body. We don't have just useless body parts. Even the appendix has ser serves a, a function. Um, and so all of our body parts and the body parts of this church are necessary, and that's how God views the church. And so you are an important player on the team, just like a football team. So... The church is the body of Christ. You are a vital part of it. And that's what the Bible says. That's what God says, that we're all part of that body and we all have a role in it. So let's look at Ephesians chapter 3, verses 6 to 11. Paul's talking here about the mystery of the gospel. Now, when the, Paul's using the term mystery, he's not saying something like confusing, like something you have to solve. The word risk, mystery basically means something that was hidden. And then God has revealed what that is. So how does God reveal the mystery of the gospel? This is something they didn't fully understand until, it was, it, until Jesus came. And now it is revealed. The gospel is revealed fully. And it says in verse 6, this mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs. It's not just something that belongs to the Jews. It also belongs to the Gentiles, as was promised to, to Abraham even way before them. Members of the same body, going back to the body analogy, and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given me by the working of his power. To me, though, I am the very least of all the saints. This grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. And here's the key. So that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purpose that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, God from the beginning of the world knew that he would create the church and it was through the church that God would reveal his wisdom to powers and authorities that are seen and un unseen. That's the second point. The church reveals God's wisdom to the world. The church reveals God's wisdom to the world. See, people... And God reveals himself to the world in, in different ways. One of those ways is called general revelation, and that is what Travis talked about at the beginning. And so if you see this little mark on my arm and you ask, well, what is 120? It's from, actually from Romans 120, which Travis shared earlier, which basically says, since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen uh, being understood from what was made so that man is without excuse. So what we can know that is true about every human being, they have no excuse for saying that God doesn't exist. It's obvious. I'm going to go talk about it for the whole sermon, so i got to stop myself. But it's obvious. God's existence is obvious. You can look outside. You see the stars. You see the mountains. You see the intricacies of the laws of physics. And the more science advances, the more powerful and evident it is that God is beyond anything that we could see or understand, that he is an indescribable, uncontainable, unfathomably powerful, mighty God. Just looking through science through an electron microscope and looking into the, our human cells. See, I'm doing it. Looking into our human cells in the 1950s when they invented the electron microscope, when Charles Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, 
he basically, all they saw was the cell and it was just a blob of protoplasm. They didn't know. They thought that was as simple as life got and small as life got, but the electron microscope saw this world of circuitry and nanotechnology and factories inside of our cells. So when the Bible says we are fearfully and wonderfully made, it's beyond what we can understand and it all points to the God who made it all. So no one can say that God doesn't exist. They can say it, but going back to Romans 1.18, it says they suppress the truth by their wickedness and they worship things that are created rather than the creator, which goes back to another song that we sang. So God's, amen, so God's uh, creation reveals his existence to the world and then uh, the church reveals God's wisdom to the world. And then that, that's all general, that's general revelation, but then he also reveals himself through his word, which is very specific, and that's called special revelation. So people want to know who God is, and they look to the church, and sometimes the church doesn't give a very good representative of what that looks like. Go to John 13, 35. It says, by this all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. They see the church, and they should see something different than the Elks Club or the Kiwan, I don't know what clubs they have around here. You know, a so, it's different than a social club. Not just a bunch of bickering and infighting and things that they could see anyone else, anywhere else in the world, but something that truly displays God's wisdom, the love of God to a world that desperately needs to see something radically different than they can experience anywhere else. That's what the church does. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14 to 15. These are the pastoral epistles, and it's basically Paul explaining how to set up the church, what the church should look like, what kind of functions it should serve, how, what kind of authority structure there should be in the church. God establishes elders uh, to lead the church. I'm, I'm, I'm so glad our church, and I know it's difficult. I know change is hard, and I know the older you get, the harder change is, and the more you've been doing things one way, but... We always have to have a willingness to conform the way that we think to what the Word of God says. And I'm so glad that we took this step to follow a biblical model of church leadership. And I know, you know, it's going to take change and adaptation and all of that stuff, but... Um, where was I? First Timothy 3 chapter. He, so in First Timothy 3, he's establishing this is how the church should look like in terms of elders and deacons and the qualifications that he should have. And then in verse 14... He says, I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing thing, these things to you so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. What is the household of God? He goes on to say, which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. A pillar and buttress of the truth. The third point is, in a culture where truth and reality itself are under attack, the church upholds, defends, and protects the truth. That's what the church does. So people want to see what the truth is. They shouldn't see a church that's just going with the flow and changing with the times and changing what we believe so that we could be relevant. I mean, the form of what church looks like can change, but not the function of the church and what we believe and what our foundation ultimately is. That should always be the same. And I think... As much as people are going into this postmodern, oh, I don't believe in absolute truth, and, you know, I can believe what I believe, and I, it's just as true, and you believe what you believe, and it's just as true, but they really believe what they believe is better even when they say that. But, you know, that's the culture we live in. But I really think deep down people want to see a firm foundation. People don't want to build their lives on the sinking sand or the shifting sands of this ideology or that ideology and blown about by any kind of wind of teaching that comes along and things. And yeah, they want things that make them feel good. And it's all about their feelings and not about what's true. But I really think deep down people want to build their lives on something solid that doesn't change, that doesn't give them anxiety because, you know, it can change. And something they believe now could be something that's totally abhorrent in, in two, days, two days later or two minutes later. So truth and reality itself are under attack in our culture. But the church is what should be upholding, defending, and protecting the truth. And I think of uh, buttresses. When I took French, like I, I studied like Notre Dame, and I haven't looked at the rebuilding of it because I knew it was on fire a while ago, but they had these things on the side called flying buttresses. And they like were basically these big 
pillars that went over to the side and they supported and held up the cathedral of Notre Dame. In the same way, the church, and who's the church? Us, upholds, defends, and protects the truth. We hold it up for display. Matthew A. Poole, in his commentary of the Holy Bible, he says, it isn't that the church is the foundation for the truth, but the, the church holds up the truth so the world can see it. He says, pillars also were of ancient use to fasten upon them any public edicts which princes or courts would have published and exposed to the view of all. Hence, the church is called the pillar and basis or the seal of truth because by it, the church, the truths of God are published, supported, and defended. And I am thankful, and I, I share this with uh, the church that I came from as well. I'm thankful to be in a church that doesn't just follow trends, follow whatever's fashionable, run this way or run that way or follow this movement or follow that movement. But we stand, we have elders who stand for the truth, and we're not afraid to say it. And all of us should be the same way. And I'll, I've said this before, I'll say it again. Anything that I believe that's against the word of God, I don't care how comfortable with it, it needs to change if it is not in line with what God says. And listen, we gotta be open. If we believe what God says is true and we believe what God says is good, we have to be willing to change. It doesn't matter how long we've believed it. It doesn't mean I'm gonna like, you know, share some new truth because all the truth is in God's word. We should be very uh, suspicious of somebody saying I have some kind of new truth because the church has existed for 2,000 years. Um, but we should be open and willing to correct or change our beliefs based on the light of God's word shining on them. And that's an open invitation. If I ever say anything or say something in haste or it doesn't come out right, I've said it before, but I just really want to make clear, you know, if I say something weird, come to me personally, directly, let's set up a meeting and please let's talk about it. I am, can be humble and uh, always want to learn. Um, but a lot of this church in America, the problem is it's caved to social pressure. It's caved and gone along with whatever the culture says. And so you have, you know, affirming churches or churches that don't stick to what the Bible says, or they redefine what the words in the Bible mean. That is a very dangerous practice because God is the one who wrote the Bible and authored it and he defends it. And, uh, we, we can't go against what he says, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to teach, well, in a couple series, a series called Words. I don't know if you've seen uh, The Princess Bride, but in The Princess Bride, I didn't see it because I'm a Christian, but my wife saw it. She told me, <laughs> she told me um, that uh, the Sicilian, I for, uh, forgot his name. Anyway, he, he keeps saying inconceivable. And finally, Inigo Montoya says, you keep using that word. I do not think it means what you think it means. Well, there are words used in our culture that have changed meaning that are good sounding things, love, justice, diversity, equity, and inclusion. A lot of things that sound really good, but the meanings of those things have changed. And then all of a sudden you have to say, well, I'm not for love then, but what does love mean and who defines it? All right, we'll wait, we'll wait a few, couple months for that. That'll, that'll be in the summer, but it's gonna be a series called Words. I am glad that we're part of a church that doesn't go along with those things. And so that is what God calls the church the body of Christ, and we are a vital part of it. It reveals God's wisdom to the world, and it upholds, defends, and protects the truth. And so because God prioritizes the church, and it's God's way of interacting with the world, of displaying who he is to the world, we should prioritize the church in our lives. And so here are three ways that we can prioritize the church in our lives. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verses 3 to 25. says, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Think of all the one another's in the Bible. Now I'm talking to people that are here, but think of all the one another's in the Bible. There's a lot of people who say they follow Jesus, and God, you know, God knows I'm not denying anybody's salvation, but say they follow Jesus, but say it's a private relationship. Oh, I don't need church. I don't need organized religion. Jesus is against organized religion. The Bible doesn't say that. He was against the Pharisees. Organize, that's not the same thing. Um, but 
they think they can be like, I just got me, my Bible, and God, and that's all I need. Well, you're being disobedient if you believe that. We need to correct that in people. There are so many one another's. God gives us a spiritual gift to build up what? Myself? No, to build up the church. There's so many one another's. We encourage one another. You can't encourage one another if there's not another and there's only one. We need each other. And so the first point is this. Attend regularly as a priority in your life. Put it in your family calendar. And maybe you have a phone calendar. Uh, maybe you have a written down calendar, but you can, you know, you put it, I, I don't know about you, but my family, we share calendars. So if my wife adds something into her calendar, that's something that I see. Um, we have uh, family devotionals. We put that in our calendar um, once a week. So it's something all of us prioritize in our schedule. It's very hard. I don't know if you put something in your calendar, you automatically so- sort of schedule around that thing um, for when, uh, you know, I need a haircut this week. So, you know, I get together and figure out, okay, these are the times I could do a haircut. I don't say, oh, I'm not going to do this because it's already in my calendar. I think the things we prioritize are in our calendar. So attending church should be a priority. And uh, Luke and I went to the Holy Land, Dallas, <laughs> Texas. Uh, Luke and I, you know, we went to Arlington, Texas. I forget what's there, uh, the, the AT&T Stadium. Luke and I went there two Octobers ago. And the most important thing was, like, we have to find a church to attend to. We're not just going to go and not attend church. And so, you know, we found a church. Um, they had a Saturday night service because we had to be there early for Sunday. But we still, church is a priority. Church is not, if we go to Vermont to visit my parents, we find a church up there uh, to visit. So even just attending church regularly should be a priority in your life. I realize, you know, sometimes there's really important things that come up. You know, that should not be like a regular occurrence. Um, We should be showing our families and everything that attending church is something that, that's something the Belmares do. That's something we taught our kids since the very beginning. It's not a question of, you know, do we want to or not? Do we feel like it or not? It's just what we do. It's It's an automatic thing. So attending regularly is one way we can prioritize the church. So thank you for being here. You could, you know, good job. Check that off. Give yourself a pat on the back. Uh, the second one is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 through 8. I think, you know, a lot of pastors and a lot of churches are afraid to talk about giving. But if God talks about it, we should talk about it. So that fits into that whole other category that we should be willing to say what the word of God says. So let's look at verse 6 in chapter 9. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Now that pattern, the sowing and the reaping and all of that has been abused by word faith teachers who's like, you know, you send them $1,000, you're going to get $10,000 back and, you know, all of that kind of thing. That is not what this is talking about. The sowing is on us and the reaping, what God gives and blesses us with, that's totally on him. He decides how to bless us. And I would much rather God decide how to bless me than me just to take something like that, you know, with my own eyes, I think is a good thing, like just, just money. Um, Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion. So you shouldn't feel compelled by me to give. You should, um, uh, under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I love that line. It's not saying, oh, I can't give cheerfully, so I'm not going to give at all. No, I should give and I should change my attitude if I'm doing it reluctantly. And God is able, he is or he isn't, God is able to make all grace abound to you so that having all sufficiency, all we need, in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. So giving is something that's, that's really like tricky, and it's something that I struggled with because I, early in my marriage, and even after I was you know, more on fire for God and following him and going to church every week, we had times when we had serious, severe financial struggles. The condo that we lived in that we just sold, we were behind on payments on uh, for certain reasons, and we were just really struggling to make ends meet. I was working five part-time jobs at the time just to try to make it work. And my pastor would teach about tithing, and I would feel incredibly guilty. 
And I remember we had financial peace, and I went to the leaders of financial peace, and I said, here's my budget. We're not going out to eat every, you know, every day. We're not like, I feel like we're being as careful and frugal as possible. Please show me how I can, what I can do. Because I want to give. I feel guilty that I'm not giving. And they looked through our budget, and they said, yeah, you're, you're doing, you know, it seems like you're doing everything right, but why don't you just give something and be faithful with it and see what God does? And so we chose an amount and we were faithful and we gave that every week. And somehow, and it didn't line up in my budget. It didn't make sense to my eyes. It was like I should be like short this amount of money every month. And then my pastor came and he preached and he worded it just differently. And sometimes people word things a certain way and it just clicks with you. And it clicked with me and he said, if it lines up in your budget, you're living by sight and not by faith. If it makes sense in your budget, it doesn't, you're not trusting God. And I said, do I trust God or not? Well, it's an easy thing to say. <coughs> Excuse me. It reminds me of the beginning of the song, Life Song by Casting Crowns, but it says, empty hands held high, such small sacrifice. If not joined with my life, I sing in vain tonight. In other words, my life, the way I behave, the actions that I take should prove out that I truly trust in God. And money, for some reason, is a really difficult one um, to really trust God in. And... I just said, you know, God gave me, he healed my marriage. He gave me two amazing boys that without God, I cannot, would not have them. He gave me a good life. And if I have to live in a smaller place, I have to downsize, whatever it is, I'm going to give faithfully, regular, sacrificially, and I'm going to trust God with the results. And we decided, we began tithing at that point, and we never stopped. We got... Well, I'll, I'll share personally uh, if you ever, if you want to ask like about things that happened in my life as a result, um, I'll be happy to share them. I'm not, I'm not going to do it now, but God has always taken care of us. We got a loan modification in our condo. We were able to stay there and God has just really worked things out. In fact, um, one of the things that you are not, you're told you don't do with God is you don't test him, right? Jesus said to Satan, he said, it is written, do not put the Lord your God to the test. But there's one area, and this is in Malachi, and Malachi is written to the nation of Israel. It's not written to us. However, God tells Israel to test him in this one thing. It was in their tithes. He said, test me in this. See if I don't open the windows of heaven and pour out more blessing than you can even contain. I mean, they don't know what that blessing actually looks like, but he says, put them to the test in their giving, in their tithes and offerings. That looked different in that culture than what it looks like here. But number two is this. Demonstrate that you really trust God and give cheerfully, sacrificially, and generously. And here is how I learned and I'm not, please, I'm not holding myself up as some paragon of excellence in anything because I told you what my life was like with me in charge of it. I am not. It is Christ in me who creates anything good. But this is what I realized. I read this book called The Treasure Principle by Randy Alcorn. And it's a very small book. I recommend reading it. Really good. It'll take you like an hour, two hours max. And... I realize that the Bible says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, or everything thereof. That means everything I have belongs to God. Now let me ask you this. Is it easier to give away your stuff or someone else's stuff? Well, let me ask the government. <laughs> All right. Filter didn't catch that one. It's easier to give away some things that don't belong to you. I realize everything I have belongs to God, so I don't have to hold on to it so tightly. I can let it go. Money, for some reason, giving is an opportunity to truly put our money where our mouth is and show that, that whatever I give to God, I believe that he can do more with it than I could do with it myself and that I know that God has me. I know, like it says, you know, that he is sufficient, that he is all I need, that he's going to have me. He's, I, I really trust in him. As Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. God takes care of the lilies of the field and the birds of the air, and they're not worried about where everything's coming from. I don't need everything I have. We don't need everything we have. You know, we compare, oh, all right, I got to move on. We, all right, we compare ourselves, we, so often we compare ourselves to people that have more than us, but go on a missions trip. Go to Haiti. I went to Haiti in 2006. I, ha I saw kids there having more joy when all they had to play with was a half-deflated soccer ball. 
than people, the rich in America, and that's almost anybody in America is rich, comparably speaking, than, you know, the people of Haiti. It's odd. They did a study that the happiness index, they call it. In America, we're not even in the top 20 of countries in the latest release of the happiness index. Now, I didn't go into all the methodology and all of that, but basically, it's young people today. Now, imagine when you were young, you had to play outside, and you went to school uphill both ways through 10 feet of snow every day, even in the summer. I don't know. Do you remember that, Richard? No, give me a, I don't know. No, used to, no that wasn't an ooh. It was just, you know, things you would think materially, if you're older, you're like my age or you're older, you remember things were harder, you had to work harder, you didn't have all information right in the palm of your hand. And now, like, people have everything they need, there's no real, there's not like major struggles in the way that there used to be. Um, our culture puts some on kids, but, you know, they're, they're more depressed than they ever were because material things will not fill the need that people ultimately have in their heart. All right, 1 Peter 4, 10 through 11, and this kind of circles us back to the beginning with spiritual gifts. It says, as each has received a gift, talking again about spiritual gifts, use it to serve one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace, whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The third point is this, serve faithfully in the church. Serve faithfully in the church. I want next year, I want the entire church at our volunteer dinner. That would be awesome. We have so many ministries that could need help, and I've had people since before I started saying, "Ah, I I do this every week. You know, it's hard. I love doing it, but it would be great to have more help or be able to take a break over the summer or things like that now and then. You know, we have Awana. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. But, you know, we have great kids programs, programs. I'm sure Kim would love more help at VBS in the summer. We have a great youth ministry. Uh, We need help for events and needs and things that are going on. Um, So serve faithfully. Find some way that you can plug in. Um, Maybe it's helping uh, Pastor Travis uh, in doing the sound or doing video or the things that he needs help with for the Sunday service. I know that's something he could use help with. Or maybe uh, Pastor Jim needs help with the outreach and the missions. I don't know, talk, ask, you know, ask us and, and we will find ways to get you plugged in. When I started in ministry, we were asked to help with kid, doing youth ministry, with doing Sunday school. We said no. Finally, we went, we did the Sunday school, and, um, or we did uh, youth ministry. We did, worked with middle schoolers and they sent us on a winter retreat. Did I share this one before? Okay. We went on a winter retreat. And we weren't feeling connected with the teens. And we said, you know, when it was just Shelby and I, we didn't know what to, could, do I have to watch teens every second? These are about 12-year-olds, mostly 7th graders. Do we have to watch them every second? Can we let them go? Will they die? There's a lake. I don't know. I, I honestly, I didn't know. This is, you know, before we even had children. And so we went on this winter retreat and we said, this is going to decide if we want to continue in youth ministry. If it's not a good connection, if it doesn't feel like it works, we're just going to let them know, you know, this isn't for us. Now, obviously, I've been doing youth ministry for 23 years, so you can probably guess the spoiler, but there was the, I've never seen snow accumulate so fast as on our drive there. And I didn't even really know how to get there. We didn't have GPS then. I'd only been there one other time, and I couldn't even see. And we were driving in separate cars, the girl in her car. We had, she had two girls. I had three boys. That was it. And she was eating Swedish fish, not Shelby, the girl in her car, Lauren. Uh, she was eating Swedish fish the whole ride up, big bag, and we finally, somehow we made it up there. Well, one of the seventh graders had gone there many times, so he kind of like guided us. I think you take a left here. We got there. It was a miracle. We get there, the kids, the boys, it was a disaster. The kids were like playing with fire, and they got yelled at. They almost like burned down the cabin, the boys, you know. Um, then... One of the kids, I had to go to the hospital on Saturday because the kids were tubing and one of our kids was laying there with his leg bent at an odd angle. And I went to the hospital and 
Um, I didn't have, I lost like this, I'm supposed to have all the kids' health forms. You know, I was really on it. I couldn't find his health form. So I called his mom and she's like, you know, okay, fine. So we get back. Oh, and the first night she was up with a girl, Lauren, and Shelby hates puke. The girl eating Swedish fish was like throwing up all night. And Shelby's like, what do I do? I think I'm supposed to comfort her or something. So it was like everything went wrong on this retreat. We get back, never having a chance to really talk about it because we're all doing our thing separately, her with the girls, me with the boys. We get back, the parents pick up their kids, and I know she's going to be like, yeah, this was terrible. We look at each other and we're like, that was awesome. (laughs) It's not what you would expect. So if you don't know how to plug in or where to plug in, this is what I say, sign up for something. Sign up and see. If you work with children and you're like, you know, obviously we're going to do a background check and everything to protect our kids, but if you work with children, the worst thing you find out is, okay, it's not that one. You know, I'll try, I'll try teens. I'll try something else. Um, but everyone who is a follower of Jesus should be serving in his church. So serve faithfully in your church. Put your resources, time, treasure, talents, into what God values which is the church. Here's today's takeaway. How you prioritize the church in your life has a powerful impact, not only on your own life, but on generations to come. Put your church first by faithful attendance, giving, and serving. Attendance, giving, and serving. And now what we talked about at the beginning how we join the church, the church, the universal church throughout history when we take communion. And I want to share, I usually share out of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, but in our our group this morning with Mario, we were looking at Matthew chapter 26. The origin of the story, the, the original Last Supper. I do know where Matthew is. And it says... Jesus is having, they have a meal, and as they were eating, um, first Jesus tells them who would betray him, which, you know, is Judas. And in all of this, Judas has this plot to betray Jesus. They ha- he has this meal uh, during the first day of unleavened bread. And if you want to turn to chapter 26, you know, it's in there. But um, Jesus tells his disciples, go find this certain man. Um, he's going to keep the Passover at his house with his disciples, so they go, and they're having this Passover, and the Passover, I know there's um, theologies or religions in our culture that teach the wafer and the juice or the wine is, becomes the actual body and blood of Christ. And I remember somebody saying this to me, and I'm saying, well, it has to be symbolic, but he says, this is, he, his response, well, he says, this is my body, and I wondered, well, was he, I know, I'm sorry, it sounds gross. Was he taking pieces of his body or was he holding up the bread and saying, this bread is my body? It's a metaphor. He's comparing his body to the loaf of bread. So we, when we take these elements, we are, we're engaging in symbolism. We're symbolically showing that Jesus' body was broken for us so that we could have life. When we drink the grape juice, we're showing that we believe that Jesus' blood was shed for us. And that's why communion is only for believers. It's for people who have actually believed that Jesus died on the cross for their sins, he paid the price for their sins, and God raised him from the dead. Otherwise, you're, being, you're disrespecting the elements, you're disrespecting what Jesus did if you just do it trivially. So I encourage you, if you have not trusted in Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior of your life, don't take communion. Take communion confidently if Jesus is the Lord and Savior of your life, if you truly believe he died on the cross for your sins and that God raised him from the dead. So before he does that, and Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 says, before you take communion, you should examine yourself. Because communion, we do it once a month. It's really a good opportunity to stop and, and look at your life. Maybe think of the message. Is there something I can do to attend church more regularly? How can I support the church through giving more faithfully? Um, how could I serve with my time and, and help the church in ways all of us have gifts, all of us have talents, things that we could do to help the church. You know, maybe there's something that I'm not doing. That's a chance for God maybe to, to give your heart conviction. 
And this is something you should be doing. This is something you should be doing more the same as he's done with me many, many, many times. And maybe he'll do it again in a minute. But it's a chance to really examine yourself. Think about, you know, where you are with God. If you've trusted in Jesus, you are forgiven. It's not a question of your salvation. But it's a question of, you know, is there somebody I need to make peace with? Is God bringing somebody in remembrance? Is there somebody I need to forgive? Is there something I need to let go of? Is there something I need to just really step out in faith in my life? And so we're going to celebrate communion, but first we're going to take a few minutes and just uh, pray, examine ourselves, and prepare. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your great love. Thank you, God, though there was nothing good in us, nothing in us for which we deserve your grace and mercy and love. You are a loving God. It is your nature, and you poured it out on us by sending Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, God. So I pray, God, that today and every day we could be just thankful And live our lives as a thanksgiving for you paying the ultimate price so that we could have the ultimate gift. I pray that you bless the bread, bless the wine, the grape juice, God. I pray that you bless those elements, God, and help us to take it with the seriousness that you showed in what it all represents. In Jesus' name, amen. In Matthew 26... It says, now as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. He took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Let's stand. We're going to sing one more song, and then we're going to have Don and Nancy Estep come up, and we're going to... Honor them as they plan on moving. So, come on.